A certain generation here this, present here this morning will remember, I only know the Afrikaans word for that, cadetta. I don't know what is the English word for that. Um, now, I was, I was in Itosha High School. I've got a fellow Itosha High School friend here, um, Solomon. We, we joined, ach, we, we have that in common. We have served in that school and we even played rugby for the same team there, um, Solomon. But I was in high school Itosha's marching band. And um, I know John also played in a marching band, but he's not here this morning. You too. What did you play, Josie? You were the drummer. I can just imagine that. <laughs> Bang the drum, my friend. <laughs> I played the trumpet. First, first started with a bugle. I made my whole neighborhood mad. My mom is smiling. Because those things have a loud, a loud <laughs> noise. But the thing is, when you play some of these instruments in the marching band, they need to shine. I mean, those instruments. When, it's, when there's a piece of silver, it needs to shine. A piece of copper or brass, it needs to shine. And, and we used um, brasso. I don't know if you still get it. Brasso and silver to, to polish those instruments. Man, that trumpet needed to shine. If not, even for practice, you would be chased around the field, my friend, or do some push-ups or something. Um, but your instrument had to shine. And that's what we used to, to shine, make it shine. These brass and, and silver that you get. Now, what has that got to do with the false teachers in Ephesus? The false teachers of the law in Ephesus, those who said that you need to keep the law to be right with God, during Timothy's pastorship there, used the Jewish law like that brass or silver to make them shine and look good, to show off their righteousness and have a goodness before God, or so they thought. The law was seen as a means to obtain or maintain their spiritual shine. But as a result, they have started to dislocate from the gospel. Dislocate of the, from the gospel of grace. Because suddenly you now have to work for the salvation. And we've just heard we are saved by grace. Dislocate from the gospel of grace. Dislocate from faith. All these blessings we get from God and salvation we get from God by faith. Now you need to work for it. In Christ alone, no. For the glory of God alone, these teachers were now getting the glory. And those who shone the most by keeping the laws, they got the glory, but not God. So how did Paul respond to this threat in his letter to Timothy? Well, he wanted Timothy to remind them that of the proper use of the law, which they totally used unlawfully. We read of that in verses 8 to 11. Um, they said that the law, if you keep it, can bring you in, into a righteousness that is acceptable to God. Paul said, no, remember, Timothy, the law is there for sinners and lawbreakers to so show them their sin and their guilt before God. And cry out for salvation from its penalty. And cry out for one who would keep that law perfectly on their behalf. And therefore Paul reminded, that that's in Jesus Christ that we find that. Therefore Paul reminded Timothy that, you know, this, this law can never be taught apart from Christ and his gospel. The law is fulfilled in Christ. He kept it perfectly. If you have a teaching that does not conform to the gospel, Paul says, it is not a healthy teaching. It is an unhealthy doctrine. You cannot detach the law from the gospel as if it is something that totally on its own, if you keep it, can make you right with God. But then Paul did the following in the, pa in the passage that we've read. Then he said, 
If you want proof of this, of how this works, of, of the fact that we are saved by grace and mercy and through the gospel and Jesus Christ, if, if you want proof of that, <coughs> to show you that you are wrong where you think that we can have all of those through the keeping of the law, look at me. Look at how I was saved. Verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy. He appointed me to his service. It's by Christ. It's in Christ's strength that he could teach and preach the gospel. Not his own, not because of his own goodness. The second thing that he pointed out about himself that they had to take notice of is that he was the most unworthy person to be saved. Verse 13, even though I once was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. So there was no way that through good works he could be saved. That was who Paul was. Thirdly, he pointed out God's mercy shown to him. Still in verse 13, I was shown mercy. And then fourthly, the grace of God was poured out on him along with faith and love in Christ Jesus. These four things about my life, Paul, Paul was telling those Ephesians, show that we are saved by grace and mercy and faith in Jesus Christ alone. I serve Christ because he appointed me. He saved me. And I was the most unworthy person, the second point. I was shown mercy by God. And fourthly, I received abounding grace from God to be called a son of the living God. So let's look at these four, let's call them characteristics of his salvation. The first one was this, then in verse 12. Paul served Christ's, Christ in Christ's strength, not his own. Then in verse 12, Paul humbly gives thanks. For the strength given him by Christ, who has appointed him to his service. Now strength is a translation of the Greek word dunamis, power. Paul's effectiveness as a messenger of the gospel of Christ did not depend on natural talent he had. He was a fantastic preacher. A first-rate Jewish law education, he was he sat under Gamaliel. Or following the latest Christian fads or the interesting philosophies of the Greeks. He knew them. He could quote their philosophers back to them. Or being born from a very special Old Testament lineage. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. His dad was probably a Pharisee. Paul said, I did not preach. I, I, I do not preach and teach this gospel that Christ gave me. In my own strength, as if I have got it all together and I know everything about it. No, it is in Christ's strength that I can do it. It's all about Christ by His authority and by His appointment and by His strength that I can preach the gospel. That I can tell you about this good news in Jesus Christ. Then he said an interesting thing there in verse 12. It was Christ who considered Him trustworthy for service in His kingdom. Now, through so using the word trustworthy, or faithful, or reliable, Paul was actually saying the opposite. This does not mean God looked over the earth to find the most trustworthy person he could find. Ah, there is Paul. And he picked him and said, you are going to teach my gospel to the, to the Gentiles. No, no, no. That is not the idea here. <laughs> we are not trustworthy. In that sense, what Paul was doing here was emphasizing his unworthiness for that task. For Paul, it was just mind-blowing to think that Christ would consider him trustworthy or faithful. To join in his divine mission, to be appointed by him to his service. Why? Why was it so unthinkable for Paul? Because he was a terrible person before he was saved. And he made much to show it. The second characteristics of, characteristic of his salvation that those Ephesians had to take note of to show that salvation is by grace and by mercy from God. 
is what we read of in verse 2. He first tells them, I'm saved in Christ's strength. I serve in Christ's strength. Then now he tells them. And it's not because I was so good and so cute. I was actually the opposite. You know what? I was even worse than you. Verse 13. Even though, even though, appointed by Christ in his service, even though he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. He denied. He was, a, he was a blasphemer. He denied that Jesus was the Messiah. Flat out. Flat out rejected the salvation purposes of God in Jesus Christ. Now blasphemy refers to abusive, insulting, and slanderous speech. Paul did that with regards to Christ, with regards to, believe, to believers. It describes Paul defaming Christ Jesus, his character, his person, and even those who had put their faith in him. In his ignorance and unbelief, he slandered God because he slandered Christ. In Acts 26 verse 11, we read the following about him. Many a time, that's him speaking, many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished and I tried to force them to blaspheme. That's Paul. Paul tried to force Christians to speak disrespectfully. To malign the Son of the Living God, the second person of the Trinity. That's blasphemy. He was also a persecutor, he says. Acts 3, verse 8, just after Stephen was killed. Paul's, I'm reading, Paul's, but Saul, pardon me, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. He later explained in his testimony to King Agrippa, and it might be good if you go there with me because there are quite a few verses I want to read. Acts 26, Acts 26 verse 9 to 11. This is what he, what he explained in his testimony to King Agrippa. Acts 26 verse 9. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. That was Paul. And he was also a violent man. I mean, we just read, he mercilessly tracked down Christians as far as Damascus. That's about plus minus 300 kilometers north of Jerusalem. He was ravaging the church. He did not politely ask the men and women, come to me and jump in the police wagon and let me take you to Jerusalem. He was not offering them a Coke and hamburger on the way. No, we read that he dragged them. You can see them kicking and screaming. Throwing them into prison. Not pushing them lightly into it. Throwing them into prison. He stood by with a grin of approving satisfaction on his face when Stephen was stoned to death. That was why Paul was so amazed that Christ would entrust him with the gospel of salvation. Appointing him to his service. And that's why you and I should stand absolutely amazed that Christ saved us. Paul regarded himself the least of the apostles. The worst of sinners, we read, we read there in verse 15. And now you may ask, but how then was he saved from eternal punishment? If he was so, so full of sin against God, how was he saved? Well, that's the question I think that he wanted those false teachers to ask. Because they would say something like, 
Ah, it's because you were a Pharisee. Your dad was a Pharisee, and you you know you knew the Lord the law quite well, so you kept all those laws. No, he was not saved through keep the law keeping. That was the very message those false teachers in Ephesus were promoting. He was not saved through fanatically persecuting those who did not follow in all these laws in the name of God. He was saved because God showed him mercy. That's the third characteristic of his salvation. That the false teachers missed. He was shown mercy by God. Still verse 3. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Now mercy refers especially to the forgiveness of sin in the Bible. Paul received this mercy when? On the road to Damascus. When the Lord Jesus appeared to him. There God forgave Paul for his violence, all his blasphemy, and all his persecutions. Translated literally, this, this part of verse 13 reads, uh, reads like this. I was shown mercy because being ignorant, I did it in unbelief. He acted like an unbeliever. Now take note, Paul's ignorance and unbelief actually disqualified him for salvation. If we read that verse, we can quickly get another picture. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. It's not to say that God was looking for the most ignorant person and the, most un the biggest unbeliever and found Paul and said, Ah, here's the guy, look at his unbelief, look at his ignorance, I am going to show him mercy. As if ignorance and unbelief qualify you for God's mercy. No, it is mentioned here to highlight his dire and lost and guilty position before God. He was saved notwithstanding his ignorance and his unbelief. And he was ignorant of Jesus and salvation through faith in him and he did act as an unbeliever. Basically saying, I acted like a pagan. Yet, Verse 13 begins with, even though I was like that, yet God forgave him. Yet God showed him mercy. The emphasis is on God's mercy to such a despicable sinner deserving of his judgment and his wrath. Paul broke the law. There was no issue about that. There was no way he could keep it perfectly. There's no way we can keep it perfectly. What he needed, what you and I needed, for a right standing with God was to not apply more man-made brass and silver to make us shine, to, to keep us on the outside looking good. No, what he needed and what you and I need is God's forgiveness for trespassing his law. Paul specifically, for blaspheming against the Son of God. For trampling on the salvation of God. Paul was in need of divine mercy. Forgiveness. Not more brass and silver to make him shine. What those false teachers needed to hear was that lawbreakers are saved by God's mercy. Not by keeping the laws of Moses. And the false teacher's emphasis on keeping the law to achieve a righteousness with God have caused another big dislocation. A dislocation from God's mercy. And if we read verse 14, His grace. That's the fourth characteristic of Paul's salvation that he wanted those false teachers to see, to show them that we are saved. By God's grace and mercy. Not by keeping all these, these laws. Verse point four. The fourth characteristic is this. The grace of God was poured out on Paul along with faith and love. When Paul was converted, he not only received God's mercy, but he also abundantly received God's grace. Along with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
Now, while mercy and grace in some ways overlap, it is fair to view mercy more in terms of judgment waived. We've already pointed that out, like in forgiveness. And grace more in terms of a positive blessing received. Grace is used to describe in the Bible a concrete favor or an act of kindness bestowed on someone. That's why we speak of, of the acronym GRACE, God's riches at Christ's expense. It is a gift. But listen, this was no ordinary gift for Paul, that despicable sinner. Look at the way he received it. It was poured out on him in abundance. Meaning, when he received it, it covered all his sinfulness. It didn't just wash his hair with it. It covered all. All his sinfulness. Meaning there was nothing of the old Paul to be seen afterwards in the sight of God. Meaning he was soaked in grace from head to toe and more spiritually speaking. That's grace. That's why we think, sing about amazing grace. Paul uses the Greek word, and I'm going to give you this one. Um, Hyperpleonazo. You can hear the word hyper. When I was a, a kid, you had shops that big shops that you would call a hyperama. Hyper means big. To describe the pouring out or in excess overflow of God's grace. God didn't use a little dropper. You, you know these droppers that you put stuff in into your uh, medicine into your ear or into your eye. God didn't use a dropper. To drop a little bit of grace on you. My dear brother and sister. It was more like a tsunami. That covered you from top to bottom. All the way so that nothing of the old John or Marinus or Ilza or Ivo was seen. Is seen anymore. Grace gushed over Paul's blasphemy. His persecution of Christians and his violent character. Cleansing him from those and all other transgressions. Making him new. Making him clean and acceptable to God. By reckoning Christ's cleanness. Christ's righteousness to him. What an amazing and astounding gift this grace is not. Would you agree to that? That's why we sing about this grace in so many Christian songs. Maybe nearly every one of them. Now, when Paul wrote that grace was poured out on him abundantly, he was not exaggerating. He expressed the facts with careful precision at the end of Romans 5. Romans 5 verse 20, we read the following. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And now all these pictures that, that I've given you in terms of grace being poured out on us make sense. Question, is there a sin or a sinner too big and too ugly and too hideous to not be covered by God's grace? No. Look at Paul. The more the sin, the more grace will just keep on flowing to cover it and wash the sinner clean. There is no end to God's grace. And now you can just think. This letter was written to Timothy, but at the end of the letter we, we get the understanding that it was read to the whole church. So coming in on a Sunday morning... And they knew who those false teachers were, believe me. I can just see when Paul speaks about them, how the next would go. Okay, so it's that. That, mm, mm, that one. And you can just hear their question, Paul, yes, right. But you know, what proof is there of that kind of grace in your life? You, you talk about grace. You talk about it being poured out on you. 
But you know, my proof is that I, I keep these laws and people can see that. But what is your proof? What can people see to prove to them that you are? You have been receiving this astounding grace of God. Paul said, okay, you want proof? Along with God's grace, he gave me faith in Him and love for Him and my neighbor. And didn't Jesus say, this is how the world will know that you are my disciples, that you will love one another? Paul says, this is how I know, and you know, and you can see, tangibly experience, that I have received this abounding grace of God. I have received Christ's faith and love as well. Something that I had not had before. I mean, before Christ, Paul B.C., before Christ, I persecuted Christians. I blasphemed God. I hated Christ. But look at me now. Am I still doing the same thing? No. Now I want to live for Christ. Now I see death as gain because then I will be with Christ. You know what? Now I trust Christ. Now I have faith in Christ. I did the opposite before. Christ saved me and poured out His grace on me. Grace on me. And you talk about love. You want to see my love. Look at the man whom I was before. I killed some of you. I killed believers. I dragged them off to the, to the prisons. I stood by when Stephen was stoned. I watched the clothes of the men who were busy killing him. Am I the same person now? No. Now I'm being flogged. Now I'm being the one persecuted. Because I love Christ and I love you. And I want you to have this fantastic good news of salvation to be found in Christ alone. Can you see? Receiving this wonderful grace of God will show. It will show in my faith and trust in God and in Jesus Christ. And it will show in my love for the Lord and His people. Take note that grace not only outstrips our sins, it not, not only covers and washes away our sins so that we can stand clean and right before God, it also instills its visible expressions, which are the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 14. You see, when grace is poured over us in abundance, it does not just clean us up. It leaves behind Christ's faith and love. Only to be found in Christ. Hatred and unbelief are now replaced with love and faith. Hearts previously filled with unbelief, violence, blasphemy are now made new and filled with faith in the very one you made jokes of before. In whose name you used to swear. Hearts once filled with hatred for God and Christians and the church. Are now filled with love. A devoted, sacrificial, Christ-like love. For those, listen, whom you and I have ridiculed before. I made fun of Christians before I was saved. Whom I teased for their faith. Whom I mocked because they did not want to join me in my parties. I verbally persecuted them because they would do anything to go to church on a Sunday morning. Even give, give up triple overtime rates to be here. Why? Where does this come from? It doesn't make sense in the worldly mind. It is a sovereign gift of God flowing from His grace. That you have this faith in Christ now and this love for Him and His people now that were not there before you were lost. Paul said, Paul tells them, this is what you should see. This is the proof 
that I was saved by grace. And I've received God's mercy. Not by keeping all these laws to make me shine like that brass I did to my trumpet. Now we love them. And now you love God's, pe God's people. Now you love God's word. Now you love to hear from him. It was not like that before. Why? Why is that so? Why this change, this miraculous change? This is why, my dear brother and sister, when you were saved, the grace of God was poured out on you abundantly along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Have you experienced God's mercy and His grace poured out on you in abundance? Maybe you ask the question, how would I know? Well, is God's gift of faith and gift of love visible in your life? Faith in Him, faith in Christ for salvation, trust in Him when things go wrong, but ultimately trust in Him for salvation. Well, if you say, I'm not sure, well then, what you need to hear this morning is what those false teachers had to hear from Paul, summed up in one sentence. You still have your Bibles open? It's a short sentence. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15. I want you to read it with me, so please go there with me. He summed it up in one sentence. Will you read it with me? Out loud? Will you commit to that? No. This is what Paul tells them. Christ Jesus. Please. Say with me, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which <laughs> that's grace, that's mercy, that's you who have been saved. But if you're not saved, you have to take note of this. This is the summary of the gospel. Christ Jesus came into the world from heaven to save sinners. And if you're that lost sinner today, who still stumble in unbelief and ignorance, my dear friend, today, don't waste time, today, place your faith in this Jesus Christ, who came into the world to save a sinner like you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, what an amazing statement and truth. Summed up in one sentence, your son Jesus Christ came into the world to save a sinner of whom I am the worst. By grace, a gift that we do not deserve, through mercy, well I deserved eternal hell. But in Christ it was paid for. Oh Lord, help our hearts to start off where Paul started off with this passage, to thank you. Being thankful for your salvation, thankful for your grace, thankful for your mercy, thankful for your love, your love and your faith that you've given us so that we can serve you and be appointed in your service as children of God. Amen.